Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first meeting of our People Before Profit Healthcare Week 2020. So my name is uh, Connor Reddy, and uh, I'm the People Before Profit rep for Dublin Northwest. And uh, tonight we've got a, a fairly special meeting uh, lined up where we'll talk about, I think, the, the topic of the year, uh, COVID-19. Uh, and we'll talk about a special uh, document that we've just uh, produced, uh, a roadmap, an all-Ireland roadmap for uh, a zero COVID strategy. Um, so I think uh, zero COVID, unfortunately, is discussed quite a lot, but uh, not uh, very well understood, at least from our uh, experience. So uh, to tease through uh, the specificities of zero COVID or elimination, what it actually means and how we get there, uh, we're joined by a really uh, excellent panel uh, of, of people tonight. Uh, well, we will be joined by one more uh, quite soon. Um, so we have, uh, in the order that I'll speak, uh, J Professor Jerry Killeen uh, from University College Cork, uh, where he's a professor of applied pathogen ecology. You might have seen Jerry in the media speaking about uh, COVID strategy and the pandemic. He's been on quite a bit. Um, and he's also a member of the Irish Scientific Advocacy Group, uh, a group that have done a lot of great work to uh, kind of develop and uh, argue for uh, an elimination strategy uh, for COVID. After Jerry, we'll hear a little bit from Maeve O'Neill. Now, Maeve is a People Before Profit member and also a physiotherapist uh, from Derry. And she's uh, going to tell us a little bit about her experiences on the front line uh, of the pandemic in Alt Nigeldon Hospital. Uh, obviously, Derry has been a city hard uh, by the pandemic um, in the last few months. So we'll hear a bit uh, about that from her. And then finally, uh, hopefully if he joins us soon, uh, we'll hear a little bit from Richard Boy Barrett, the People for Profit TD for uh, Dunleary. So Richard will walk us through, uh, I guess, uh, uh, the legacy of, uh, I guess, government failings on COVID, failings to properly resource testing and trade test and trace system, failures to properly resource the health service, and uh, I guess uh, the deficiencies of uh, the so-called living with COVID strategy or strategy rolling lockdowns that, uh, that the government seem wedded to at the moment. So to discuss uh, the alternative tonight, uh, I think we'll start with uh, Jerry, uh, and Jerry will hopefully uh, guide us through what zero COVID is all about uh, and how it is actually uh, achievable here in Ireland. So um, I guess over to you there, Jerry. Hi, Connor. Uh, is the sound coming through okay? Is this clear? That's clear, Jerry, and your presentation's up on the screen there now. That's grand, so thank you. So um, I, I'm i just going to get straight to it because I think we have a limited amount of time, and I'm not, you know, I'm going to, sadly, I'm going to start with one of these traumatic uh, pictures, which I don't present lightly. Um, there's, and the reasons, one of the reasons I have, feel I have to do this is that there's still quite a lot of discussion out there in our media and on Twitter and whatnot about herd immunity. And I just think that has to be dealt with. Um, you know, we're very lucky in Ireland that so far we haven't really seen the worst that COVID can throw at us, but not everybody on this planet has been so lucky. This is an example from Manaus in Brazil, a, a frontier city in the Amazon. Um, these are mass graves, uh, but I just want to make the point that when we think of mass graves, we often think of, uh, you know, the most misfortunate and neglected in society. We think about homeless folks, we think about um, transient folks passing through, but the reality is that, you know, uh, under these circumstances, these are all people with families and households and fairly normal lives. Um, and um, lots of people who miss them, lots of people who turned up at the funerals. And, um, and you know, they're people just like you and me. They're not, you know, if you ever have the the fun of, you know, spending a, a holiday, you know, in a Brazilian household, hanging around the kitchen, having a blab, it feels remarkably like Ireland. And, you know, this virus only sees homo sapiens. It only sees people. And in real terms, the things we have in common are much more um, similar than our differences. And, what if, so why am I zooming in on Manaus? Because, <clears throat> you know, until relatively recently, there was a lot of uncertainty about just how dangerous uh, COVID is because there had been lots of questions raised about the studies that had already been conducted. But about a month and a half ago, um, this study came out of the Amazon. And it's the first time 
that uh, somebody had done not just serology, but sequential serology. Now, serology means you test for antibodies. Uh, now, because COVID antibodies can fade sometimes, it means you've got to follow it up over time and see the trends and really, and then allow, like uh, some people don't convert, they don't, they don't get antibodies. Some people lose their antibodies fairly fast. And in this study, they accounted for it all. It was a football team full of the best Brazilian scientists supported by some of the best public health specialists from around the world. And what they found is that COVID just ran through Manaus, um, basically un unhindered. The good news from Sao Paulo is that it's good news and then it's quite it's slightly scary news. And that is that um, despite the best efforts of the president in Brazil, the people of Sao Paulo and the state government have managed to slow down the progress of COVID. So at the time of writing this in odd, you know, August, September, uh, 80 well, 75% of the people of Sao Paulo had not had COVID. So when you allow for all that and you, you figure out how many people have been infected and you estimate what's called uh, an infection fatality rate, um, you know, there was the proportion of people who get infected who, who, who will lose their lives as a result. Um, what we find is that there's differences between places like Manaus and Sao Paulo, but that you can explain all that simply by um, on the basis of the difference in the age structure. See, Manaus is a, a frontier city, so it tends to have a very young population, lots of new people. Whereas if you go to Sao Paulo, that's an old city with a fairly stable population, and many people have been there for generations and generations. So you've got an older population. And when you break down those fatality rates by, uh, by age group, the remarkable thing is that they're you know, very, very similar. And what was kind of really disconcertingly conclusive was that it was almost exactly the same as the first estimates that came out of China and the first few places that were hit hard in this Verity et al. paper that summarized all of those. Now, when, when we read that overview from, from the Verity et al. paper, the problem was we weren't 100% sure because it didn't have this kind of methodology backing it up where we knew who had been infected and who hadn't. And, and so it kind of brings us all back to the same kind of numbers that we would have had at the outset. And unfortunately, if you take those kinds of numbers and you apply them to the Republic of, of Ireland, um, you know, you're looking at some, yeah, at, at, at fatality rates or fatality totals that we haven't even approached yet. Um, now, the, the top line is uh, PCR confirmed COVID deaths only. Uh, the bottom line is, you know, syndromic. So, you know, those people who they might not have been PCR tested, but you know, it looked like COVID, it sounded like COVID, it probably was COVID. Now, obviously, those span quite a wide range, but but none of those numbers are reassuring, and um, and that that's not a road that we would want to go down in this country. Now, the danger of this, you know, kind of very clear structuring of risk in the older age groups is that it divides society, and that is actually one of the biggest problems with COVID is that everybody perceives risk in a different way. And we've seen that this has split our society in many ways. And, and that's a thing that many countries are struggling with, notably the United States. Now, that was Brazil. Sometimes it's difficult to relate to places many of us may not have visited, but most of us know New York. And now here's something absolutely hot off the press from the world's best scientific journal. And basically, it takes a similar approach using old blood bank uh, data from um, from a, um, a dialysis uh, facility in New York and, and basically did exactly the same thing um, and characterized the fatality rate in the first wave. And first of all, the simple conclusion is that, you know, uh, less than 25% of New Yorkers have had COVID. So if they do get themselves into a second wave, there's still a long way to go, even though quite a lot of people have lost their lives and their population size for New York City is not much bigger than the island of Ireland. And they, they, they got an even higher infection fatality rate. So, I mean, I'll leave it to anybody can apply that mathematics to our own situation here in Ireland. Now, you know, why is it that we had to wait until now to um, get this level of evidence, this certainty? you know, where it's really been through one of the world's best journals, which means it's been reviewed by at least three or four of world-leading experts. 
Uh, and that's because it takes time to get these kind of analyses right, get the text balanced and be absolutely sure of what it says. And so, you know, uh, this was submitted in July. It was revised and accepted by October and it was you know, published in an emergency situation in a week. And that's exceptionally fast, but it just takes time to get things right and things that we're absolutely sure of. Now, uh, beyond uh, fatalities, we've also got to consider slow COVID. Now, this is a friend of mine. This is one of my, my old colleagues from Liverpool who was always a highly energetic gent. And now he's on the long COVID train. And he's, you know, the last time I read his blog, he wasn't sure he was ever going to work again. He was uh, six months in to the long COVID experience. And if you want to find out more about long COVID, he'd be a great guy to tune into, particularly as he comes from an evidence-based background, medicine background himself. He's one of the founders of evidence-based medicine. And he said plainly that for him, evidence-based medicine didn't, you know, didn't provide any solutions because um, sometimes evidence doesn't come fast enough. I mean, you just got to move on the, the data and the information and the knowledge that you've got. Uh, of course, long COVID affects young people too. We we don't at this stage know what the level of that burden is, but it's just something to keep in mind and that maybe kind of levels the playing field across the age groups. Now, for anybody who's talking about uh, herd immunity, you know, there's lots of misconceptions out there about her herd immunity. One of them is that epidemics stop at herd immunity and that that isn't true they just slow down so you know when we talk about herd immunity thresholds of maybe 60 or 75 percent you know it doesn't mean that the epidemic slows down you know it stops at that point it just means that it slows down and then goes into a slower burn uh, but it basically means that almost everybody gets infected and then you know for people who think that an endemic scenario after all that's over is necessarily a stable one, I would say we cannot be sure of that. And there are many, many diseases in the world which have uh, what are called um, endemic epidemic transmission patterns. And what that means is that um, because immunity is long lasting, it, it goes in cycles. You know, there's epidemics, people build up immunity, Eventually, that immunity fades, and then there's an epidemic again. And you know, one of the classic examples of that is is dengue, uh, which goes through, you know, spectacular epidemics every few years. Uh, and then things like chikungunya, which sweep through the tropics every 40 to 50 years, uh, because immunity to, to to chikungunya is very very long lasting. So, what that end game endemic picture would look like, the reality is none of us would know. Okay. So have we seen anything like this before? Uh, we have. Uh, and the closest relative of COVID that we're aware of is SARS-1. So COVID is often called SARS-2. Um, and uh, they're closely related. But this is what happened with SARS-1. SARS-1 spread, spread around the world just as fast as SARS-2, but then it was stopped. And it reached Ireland. There was one patient isolated, I think, somewhere in, in the west of Ireland. It reached many countries, but then it was stopped. And it was stopped with uh, what we call, often we refer to in this country as, as uh, contact tracing and isolation. But of course, it's a broad, much broader uh, response that involved lots of other things. And, you know, the kind of diseases that, um, the kind of diseases that, contact tracing has worked for very well in the past are diseases like SARS and like Ebola. Now, Ebola is an extreme case. Why does it work so well? It works so well because almost everybody gets sick. Okay. Now, Ebola is an extreme example. and I'm sorry to show these dramatic images, but I just want to make the contrast between the task of, um, of case and contact management for highly pathogenic diseases with much higher fatality rates and much more consistent pathology than SARS-2. Uh, so like if you got SARS-1, you were going to get sick. If you were one of the 5% that didn't get severely sick, maybe that you were lucky, but the next person would certainly get sick. And in the case of Ebola, you know, when this happens to somebody, you notice and everybody responds. And then that, that retrospective contact tracing begins. But um, SARS-2 or COVID is much more like malaria in that uh, a lot of most people carrying it aren't aware of it unless they're 
super vigilant and, and really get themselves tested at the faintest sign of, sign of symptoms. And so if you look at these kids, these are, so this is the disease I normally work with. Um, most of these children have malaria. They uh, are not uh, very conscious of it because they've been used to it since they were very young. Um, there's one or two kids missing from this picture. They're the ones that didn't make it. They're the ones, you know, all these kids would have had malaria several times before they were five years old. By the time they're five, they've got enough malaria or um, immunity to protect them for the rest of their lives. They may become chronically ill, but they won't, you know, it's not going to kill them. But the price for that and herd immunity, what herd immunity looks like is the kids that are missing from this picture. And in the average class up to about 10 years ago, there would have been one or two children missing for exactly that reason. Now, when I started reading the data coming out of China, a lot of it really sent a shiver down my spine because I recognized the similarity to malaria in terms of not only you know, mild symptoms, generally speaking, but also very vague, um, variable symptoms that are really difficult to diagnose. And this is a nice paper written by some Chinese physicians describing all the different types of manifestations that they had uh, for COVID in their ward, which makes it very difficult to, to distinguish, you know, uh, in a clear cut way. And what that means is that it just takes much longer to identify an index case than than you would for SARS-1. So you know, at most, a transmission chain of SARS-1 can extend for about three viral generations. So it'll it'll extend through three people before somebody notices, and you start you know tracing retrospectively. Uh, however, for for SARS-2, you know that can go on for you know up to five it can go run through up to five people before somebody gets sick enough that they feel compelled to get tested and what that means is you end up you have to go back an awfully long way through the transmission chain and these gray kind of uh, rectangles are the amount of capture that we would get on those transmission chains if we were using say the current hse 48 hour um kind of uh, retrospective tracing guidelines. You've got to go much further back. And that's how you end up with um, these spectacular, um, you know, contact tracing diagrams because these outbreaks can get very, very large before, you know, one or two people get really sick and then you start the process of going back to them. Now, what that means is that um, investigation, I'm not going to call it, um, contact tracing, it's much, much more than that. That outbreak investigation is a very, very big job for COVID. It's much bigger than it would have been for SARS or for Ebola. And so therefore, our public health teams, and we have some excellent ones, like this team here from the HSE, who, who characterized this now internationally famous case study, um, you know, they did a superb job, but they can't do this level of investigation if we have too many outbreaks ongoing at the same time. So if we don't want to go with the, the herd immunity road, and we would prefer to do something on the other side, well, what would we do? What's the first example that we have? The first example we have is China, uh, which is a huge place. Uh, you know, its different provinces are not unlike the European Union in size. Its population is vastly bigger than the European Union or the United States, or both of them uh, put together. And they warned us, you know, as soon as they'd figured out what was going on themselves, they published an absolute fire alarm paper in The Lancet, which rushed it through in a week, which almost never happens. And, you know, while they were all publishing in English in the world's leading journals to warn the rest of us, they got busy uh, and, you know, they already had COVID in their country. They warned us what was coming and then they set about dealing with their own internal problem. Now, the, the first thing, Thing they did was to introduce really um, ambitious restrictions. I think it's important to note that the Chinese didn't get everything right. They tried some kind of, um, they tried half measures a little bit early on and that just didn't work. So then they, they, they souped up their approach, they got more ambitious and anytime things went wrong, they really quickly put their fat back on the accelerator and they got themselves back down to zero. Um, you know, and, and they've been there for quite some time. 
Now, um, what I find very encouraging is that you know through most of their downward progress, the reproduction number uh, you know that they achieved, which means um, that their size of their epidemic was shrinking by half every two weeks, really um, was very comparable with ours. And but once they got down to the end game, they really threw the kitchen sink at this. They were isolating entire families. You could see consistent mask use there. And they really, they went for it. They were um, very much primed from this based on their previous experience with SARS-1. But they also figured out the differences very fast and realized that there really wasn't any room for half measures. Now, this is what elimination looks like. This is Wuhan. Uh, this is where it all started. This is normal life back again. And I guess if I was in my 20s, I wouldn't mind a little slice of this. Um, now, the good news is, you know, we can do an awful lot of this stuff. We've already proven that. And if you go back to, um, to mid-June, uh, early June, you know, Donegal had been COVID-free for 13 days. It wouldn't have been far away from being able to, to declare itself COVID-free based on, the, on a standard uh, disease elimination countdown protocol. So we know how to do this. We're already in the early phases of a quite successful second set of um, uh, suppression interventions. And depending on how hard we push this, you know, we could be down to one case or less by early January, uh, certainly by February. So, you know, the ball is at our feet. And the question is, what do we do with it next? And now I'm going to, so, I mean, that's going for elimination. I'm, I'm going to talk in a little while about, you know, what we would need to do to lock that in. But for right now, I'm going to talk about what happens if we don't. So these are some of the most authoritative simulations. There's a whole ton of them. And I can show people a dozen papers that say the same thing by really good scientists who know what they're doing. And a lot of the models, you know, that they're using are the same. You know, it's 1980s science. And the reason we haven't changed that is it works perfectly well. And, you know, COVID is a virus. It behaves like other viruses. And so many elements of, you know, a lot of what it does are very, very predictable. And they're primarily dependent on what we do. And so this is a simulation to explore our, you know, basically the consequences of our current Irish strategy in the context of the United States, which I think has three times the ICU capacity that we do per head of population. And they, they reckon that if you went through a sequence of lockdowns and relaxations, restrictions and relaxations, that it would take in the region of four years for the United States to queue up everybody, you know, um, and get through the whole process without ever overrunning ICU capacity. Uh, you know, but four years with their ICU facilities full, it's not a great place to be. Even if they um, they double their ICU capacity, you know, with tent cities, military hospitals, all that kind of thing, it would still take two years. And so that's two years with um, with ICUs that are are you know full into the overflow capacity and we have models uh, you know i we have our own philip Hovel from cork who's who's done the same thing on a spatially explicit basis you know and and his simulations go on for years with with these cycles of lockdowns and relaxations and and then you might notice it he, you know, he's done in a spatially explicit way so you can see and you know even back in this was done in june that he was well able to predict where the hot spots would be even in the kind of the Derry Letter Kenny area and all around the country back then. So these things are predictable. And one key point that I think a lot of people are, are not as conscious of they should be is that, uh, um, you know, when people think of getting below a reproductive number of one, a lot of people underappreciate how much work that takes because we started with a reproductive number that was close to four, which means that. To get below one, you've got to at least, you know, you've got to get a rate of 75% of transmission. To get down to a reproductive number of a half, you've got to get about 87% um, reduction of transmission. So really the difference between merely containing uh, COVID and really squeezing it out of existence in real terms is very small. 
you, you, there's not much room for relaxation. Uh, and if you do allow it to relax, then you end up, uh, you know, even slightly over, you know, even a little bit of relaxation, you find yourself in this. So there's no steady equilibrium point. And if you're going to suppress, you may as well push it as hard as you can. You've also got to stop this kind of thing. Um, you know, this is just a really dramatic example of, first of all, just how much transmission can happen on an airplane before anybody steps off, and then how many people can get infected afterwards. I think it was 57 people, 12 people infected on the plane, and then 57 people all over the Republic of Ireland infected subsequently. Okay. It will also mean, until we get there, that we will need local travel restrictions. Now, it doesn't have to be county-based. You know, um, these kind of checkpoints that stop people commuting between Dublin and North Wicklow, they don't make sense, for example. You know, there's, there's lots of things that you could do to make sure that the boundaries for these things allow people to move around in sensible ways. And you know, for anybody who says we can't do that or we couldn't do that with uh, Northern Ireland, you know, this is actually Wales. This is when Wales, um, you know, uh, banned visitors from England uh, during some of the worst of the times back in May and June. And then, you know, I'll take you to uh, somewhere that is much bigger, uh, has much bigger challenges, has massive land boundary borders, has a bunch of states that are basically independently governed. They have their own health systems, their own health ministries, their own premiers, they've got everything, and they have to cooperate to make that work, and that's Australia. And they found themselves in very, very deep trouble, particularly around um, Victoria. And the second wave experienced by Australia was, was basically all in Victoria uh, and Melbourne, and then a few spillover cases into New South Wales. And the good news is they're there now. Now, they do have 10 active cases at present. Well, those are all accounted for. Everybody knows where they came from. And they're enjoying themselves. They've got lots to celebrate. And I'd say if you want to learn more about how they did that, then tune in on Thursday morning to our uh, webinar in which um, the Australian team, the chief um, health officer and one of their um, supporting economists from an independent think tank, the Grattan Institute, they'll be explaining how they got there and kind of help us figure out how we might be able to do that on the island of Ireland. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope I didn't run on too long. Thank you, Jerry, for that uh, really uh, insightful introduction. I think it's it's, uh, it's useful to have, uh, just kind of hard data to be able to uh, ground uh, the rest of what we're saying about limitation. I mean, like when you showed that uh, that example from China, I think uh, probably a lot of people's uh, eyes open to what we're what we're talking about here in terms of elimination and seeing the story in New Zealand and Australia as well. The fact that uh, there's rugby games happening in front of crowds of uh, thirty five to forty thousand people and there's concerts happening as well. Um, I think that that's uh, really a lesson of where we should be uh, aiming uh, aiming for in, in the future. Once I see there's a lot of comments coming in here and questions, so I just encourage people. To to uh, keep those coming. I see uh, there's quite a bit here about uh, supports for people, supports for workers and supports for uh, renters and people with mortgages. Uh, so we will get to that. Uh, and that is included in uh, our, our document, which we will launch uh, later on tonight when Richard speaks. Um, so there will be uh, a bit on that, but please keep uh, keep the questions uh, coming in in the, the comment section. We will come back to them soon. So uh, next up, uh, we're going to hear a little bit uh, of a different story, uh, maybe, of, uh, I guess, COVID from the front line uh, in Derry, in uh, Alton Niguel Hospital, where uh, Maeve uh, O'Neill is a physiotherapist who's uh, worked uh, through the pandemic. So maybe, uh, if you could uh, kick off there, Maeve, that'd be great. Thanks, Connor, and thanks, Jerry, for your excellent presentation. Uh, can you hear me okay? Excellent. Uh, so I, I, along with many of my co-workers, are in a wee bit of disbelief at the moment that the the Northern Executive could be uh, planning to reopen restaurants and cafes this Friday after a, a two-week circuit breaker. Um, because uh, we're still in the peak of the second wave, which is hitting us way harder than the first um, in the hospital. In the last few weeks, We've been in the situation in the north where we've nearly run out of ICU beds. We've had 100% hospital occupancy rates. Patients are waiting two days in accident and emergency departments to get a bed in the hospital. 
And numbers being admitted to hospital are still increasing with 30 more and patients recorded today. COVID patients, they don't bounce back quickly out of hospital either. So many of them are in for longer rehab journeys and sadly more lives are being lost. Um, this wave is so, so much different to the first wave, not just because the numbers are so much higher, but in the first wave, we had a full and proper lockdown. Many of our outpatient services were stood down and resources were poured into the acute services. And for the first time, we actually felt properly staffed. Private hospitals as well were utilised to support essential outpatient services. And there seemed to be a pretty good morale that we could beat this from the public and from the staff. And um, there was even that uh, weekly Thursday night clap. Um, but COVID cases who have required hospitalisation um, are as high as they were at the peak of the first wave and they're growing still. More beds and ventilators, of course, can be made available, but it's availability of the trained staff to operate those beds safely. That's the challenge. We've almost 3,000 staff in the north off work at the moment through illness or isolation. And that's in a health service that is already chronically understaffed and under-resourced. There's a, a backlog in care as well from the first lockdown. So um, our outpatient services have not been stood down this time. So we don't have the option of those staff to come in and support the acute services. And I haven't heard anything about the private hospitals this time round in the north. So to add to this uh, kind of dire enough picture, it's the time of year that we're in. Every winter in the hospital, we're often at capacity anyway, with people presenting with poor respiratory health, increased infections, the winter flu and other conditions. Uh, and on top of that, we've got the impacts of a six month lockdown, in particular our older population who have been much more isolated and less active. This is the potential to lead to increased falls per cardiac and respiratory health and per mental health. Thing, the things that had enabled people with long-term health conditions to manage them effectively have been stripped away and this will all add to the pressures to the healthcare system this winter. All the while, staff on the front line were exhausted. Healthcare workers can't work from home. We can't be furloughed. The hospital still runs and still has its challenges, even when COVID isn't swamping us. It doesn't feel like there has been much of a breather between waves, but yet there's nothing else to do but still ploy on and show up every day to support people to get better. And the resilience of staff always inspires me, but our resilience in this moment is seriously being put to the test. The stress that healthcare workers are working under is phenomenal. It's not just the fear of getting COVID with questions if uh, the PPE we wear for non-aerosol generating procedures is adequate, but healthcare workers have lives outside of work also. We have children who might be now struggling at school because uh, we had to work during the first wave and fit in their schoolwork after our work or weekends, which just wasn't enough for them. Uh, we've strained relationship with our partners who always had to step up for the childcare. We had to balance their working from home with looking after the kids because uh, we had limited flexibility with our jobs. We also are carers and have vulnerable people at home. And we worry that we might be the person who gives them the virus from our work. And we, we see no end in sight. We, like where is the PPE to prevent burnout for healthcare workers? All of us would love to get back to loving, to not loving under constant stress, but we know that this cycle of lockdown relaxation is not gonna work. And it's down to the government's handling of this crisis, North and South, it has been shambolic. They seem to be grappling in the dark, the current uh, circuit breaker approach in the north isn't enough to get the virus under control and eradicate it with them uh, thinking about relaxing things at the end of this week. And staff can, in the hospital can see the consequences of that every day. I'm not sure why I expected a competent government response north or south when you look at their track record of dealing with health or housing or environmental issues. It was the people of Ireland who made sure we had such low numbers in the first wave who made sacrifices so that more people could love. But people were rushed back to work, despite furlough being open until October. Schools went back with little planning or support for education workers. Uh, workplaces were not safe, with outbreaks in meat plants and factories typical of profit-making. 
being more of a priority than the health and safety of workers. And we even were incentivized in the North to eat out, to help out. The World Health Organization from the start has said that a lockdown is not enough and that we need to test, track and trace. So when we got the numbers under control in the summer months, these strong public health systems were not strengthened. How is it that we seem to have no long term strategy beyond lockdown and get the virus under control so we can all go out for a wee while until figures go up again and we all need to lock down again? Why on this island of about 5 million people do we not have an all-Ireland strategy for a virus that does not recognise borders and a strategy that has successfully been adopted in many other countries such as New Zealand and Australia, Vietnam and China towards zero COVID? Just just last year, health and social care workers in the north had a successful strike demanding uh, pay parity and safe staffing um, with our counterparts in England and Wales. We had great public support behind this movement, but staffing issues were never properly addressed and the pay raise is not enough. Our health and social care uh, service was on its knees before this crisis even began. Unions and healthcare workers are still fighting for a pay raise to recognise the essential work and sacrifices of frontline health and social care workers. We need fighting unions to continue to protect workers' rights during this pandemic, but also to lead the call for the type of recovery um, needed. We can't continue to work in an underfunded health and social care system. We can't keep giving big payouts to private hospitals and private care providers so that they can make a profit from our public money. We can't have unequal access to health care so that the poorest suffer in terms of access, but also in greater health inequalities that poor and marginalised people face. Going forth from this crisis, we need a fully funded all Ireland National Health and Social Care Service, but we can't wait for those in power to come to this realisation. We need to build this movement from the ground up and demand this change on an all Ireland basis and work towards zero COVID. And it's not only healthcare workers that will need to be in this struggle. Healthcare affects everyone, and so we need a movement that involves everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, May, for those uh, really powerful words, I think, and the insights into where we need to go uh, as, a, as a society. I think, if anything, the pandemic has uh, highlighted the kind of long running uh, flaws in our health service, in our schools, some of the uh, highest class sizes in all of Europe. Um, and all of these things, I think, have exacerbated uh, the spread in, uh, of the pandemic and also uh, its impact on people. So uh, unless we address those uh, longer running issues, those issues that come out of kind of rotten system that we have, neoliberal system that we we have. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're in this uh, for, for quite a while yet. So thanks for that, uh, Maeve. So um, our last uh, speaker for this part of the meeting will be uh, Richard Boyd Barris. So Richard's going to give a little bit of uh, insight into the document that we put together, which I guess lays out a roadmap for how zero COVID could be uh, realised here in Ireland and some of the supports uh, that we need along the way and some of the things that we think uh, we should do as part of a push to elimination. So that includes things like resourcing uh, a decent all Ireland national health service. It includes uh, works to schools uh, and properly staffing those schools too. So uh, it's a start and it's something that we're quite proud of. So uh, I guess uh, I'd encourage everyone to read it. It's in uh, the comment section uh, on either your Facebook uh, stream or, your, or our YouTube channel, wherever you're watching it. Uh, but Richard will uh, give it an introduction on it now. Yeah, thanks, <clears throat> Connor. And uh, thanks to Jerry uh, for a fantastic uh, introduction. Can You can hear me, by the way, can you? Connor, can you hear me? Yeah, can hear you perfect, Richard. Okay, great. The reception, my reception is not brilliant. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, look, I mean... You know, Jerry and all the the scientists and the public health people, they're the, they're the, the experts on this. And uh, Maeve and her colleagues in the health services, North and South, are obviously the people on the front line who know what all of this means uh, and the stress it involves. Uh, but for better or for worse, uh, politics does come into this in that... Um, elected representatives, governments, parliaments, and so on, uh, are then making the decisions on 
uh, how to address uh, the COVID crisis. And um, <clears throat> that's where I suppose we come in. And uh, I, I think what's fairly clear now is that the government's strategy of trying to live with COVID appears to have been based on very considerable wishful thinking that uh, you could have a sort of tolerable level of circulation of the virus and manage it and keep it at a level that wouldn't overwhelm the health service. Uh, but very quickly, we discovered that that wasn't the case. And, you know, I mean, there was a debate about uh, when Neff had said we had to move to level five restrictions and the government saying, oh, no, mate, not yet. Uh, but it was clear from the modeling, even from Neffet, who are not proposing a, a zero COVID strategy, that once the level of circulation of the virus reached a certain point, it would just go exponential. Uh, and very soon you would be at a point where our already under-resourced health service would be overrun. Um, and that not only would that mean the health service and the ICU is incapable of dealing with COVID cases, but it would be incapable of dealing with other uh, health needs, non-COVID uh, health needs. And there was simply no choice but to impose the level five restrictions. And in, in a way, it's just a big pity that they, that wasn't done earlier because the longer uh, the, the, the virus was allowed to continue to transmit at the level it was, the bigger the, the hill we had to climb uh when finally the restrictions were imposed um and it's now clear that that effort from the public for the second time around is driving down uh the transmission of the virus of the virus but the question is where do we go from here and it seems fairly clear that the government are uh, from what i can see and from the br briefings uh, that i attend with nefes and with uh the government is that short of eliminating community transmission at a certain point they are going to uh open things up again um and it seems to me fairly inevitable though i say i stress i'm not the expert but that we just go around on a merry-go-round of opening and closing uh um and having you know second and then third and fourth and fifth waves um which seems to me a pretty grim prospect. And therefore the idea that instead we would try and eliminate community transmission, which as Jerry said, we got very close to uh, earlier this year through the tremendous effort of people and then have the infrastructure in place to deal with the outbreaks that still may happen, but where the, the transmission rate is, at a, is, is low enough that you can deal with those isolated outbreaks and that we do, we aren't just in a constant merry-go-round of lockdowns, uh, opening and closing uh, lockdowns. So it seems to me that is a prize worth going for. Uh, otherwise, we're in for a pretty sort of grim uh, situation for the medium term. I mean, obviously, all of us hope that a vaccine uh will a, a, an efficient you know an effective vaccine will be developed and that you know we might be having a different discussion then but short of that uh it seems to me the zero covid strategy is the right one to eliminate community transmission and then have the infrastructure in place for us to deal with any outbreaks that may happen without having to constantly revert to lockdowns uh so uh that's i think what what the zero COVID strategy is about, and I think it's the right strategy to go for. Um, but obviously, there's an awful lot of things have to be done in order to make that uh, make that happen. Um, and uh, certainly central to it, as I understand it, is to have that tracking and tracing and uh, testing, tracking and tracing, and you know, isolation infrastructure in place, which is really able to deal with the outbreak once we get community transmission eliminated and we are very sharp far short of that and it would seem as if well it seems clear to me that the government wasted the months from june up until recently in terms of building up that infrastructure 
And even insofar as there were efforts made to build that infrastructure, uh, it was based on, uh, as we discovered, uh, people getting temporary agency contracts, terrible contracts, which are very unattractive for people, and where it was clear that the HSE saw the whole thing as a kind of temporary infrastructure rather than understanding we need to permanently build this infrastructure. Uh, and that means paying people properly. Uh, it means really resourcing public health teams that were uh, massively under-resourced, under-respected and undervalued uh, in, in our public health service. And we're still very, very far short of that. Uh, and although, you know, ICU and uh, hospital capacity can't deal with exponential growth, there's no doubt that having uh, a, a much better health system would help us deal uh, with COVID better. Uh, and we're still very, very far short of that. Uh, I mean, we went into COVID with one of the lowest uh, levels of intensive care uh, provision in our hospitals of almost anywhere in Europe, in, in the Western world, uh, about half the European average and a tiny fraction of what they have, you know, proportionate to the population in places like Germany. And very little has been done to improve that. We've added about, you know, 20 or 30 ICU beds since the outset of the crisis and are still way down. Even before the crisis, staffing levels in our hospitals were unsafe and the, and the public health system was running at nearly full capacity when, it, when a, a proper health system should always have a buffer and should be running at about 80% capacity. So there's a buffer to deal with uh, crises like that. And we're still so far short of that. Uh, and again, the government wasted the opportunity. I mean, there were huge numbers of people volunteered on the call for Ireland looking to work in the health service. And basically the HSE and the government just didn't recruit the people. And the few that they did recruit, they put on these temporary agency awful contracts, which are very unattractive, but more generally, they just didn't recruit people. And one of the things that I've discovered lately, just again from people contacting us, is the unbelievable reliance on student nurses uh, to hold our houses together, unpaid student nurses, um, thousands of them who are not being paid at all, uh, but with hundreds of nurses uh, out sick with COVID, many of them with long tail COVID, from what I hear from the INMO, uh, our student nurses who are not even being paid are actually holding together a lot of our healthcare system at the moment. Uh, so we're just mass, the, we're paying a bitter price, if you like, for the failure of successive governments to properly resource our public health system, to properly staff our hospitals, to properly invest in things like ICU, and then more recently to really build up, since this crisis uh, broke out, our uh, public health teams uh, and our uh, te testing um, and tracing uh, infrastructure. And then, of course, the other very important part of this is that any effective zero COVID strategy has to actually implement slogan that captured the imagination of many people and actually drove the majority of the population to, to endure such hardship and accept restrictions was that principle of all of we're all in it together. But it's become very apparent that that was a slogan that was not being matched by reality when it came to government policy for supporting workers who lost their jobs, people who, who, uh, who, who significantly lost income. As a result of the pandemic and the public health measures, the government has even now, with the second wave coming, cut its pandemic unemployment payments, cut the wage subsidy scheme, uh, um, and has not provided the level of support uh, to match the rhetoric of we're all in it together. And that's, to me, a very, very dangerous and retrograde failure on the government's part. Because if we're going to win this battle, uh, and have, have a strategy that can actually defeat COVID-19, we have to really support the people who are so economically, socially, and psychologically suffering. And, you know, you think about the mental health impact and the stress that this has caused our population, and then you think about the fact that we have absolutely 
desperate under-resourced mental health services that proportionate to the uh, to the uh, the health budget we spend about fifty percent of the proportion on mental health services that is average across uh, Europe. Uh, so at, at so many different levels, the government are not providing the social uh, and economic resources that are necessary to sustain the population to have a strategy that could actually defeat COVID-19. Uh, so I think it's very much our job to stress the need to have those economic, social, mental supports for the population in order to uh, uh, implement a zero COVID strategy and a strategy that could actually uh, help us defeat COVID-19 and get beyond lockdowns and get back to some sort of, you know, half decent existence for people. So I think on all of those things, our document tries to set them out. I won't go through all the details of the broad uh, brush strokes. Uh, certainly, we, I think we have to argue in the coming weeks, if, as we have for the second time round, endured all of these hardships, let's make it worthwhile by actually eliminating the transmission of this virus and putting in place the infrastructure as necessary to prevent us going into perennial lockdowns. That's me done, Connor. Thank you for that, Richard. Uh, thanks for that overview. Um, so now uh, I think uh, we're going to go to uh, some questions and some comments from uh, our viewers. So uh, it's still not too late. If you have questions, get them in. Uh, we will try to get through as many of them, uh, be they technical questions uh, about the pandemic and where we're moving, or uh, suggestions about what uh, what else we could be saying on this. I think Richard really hits a nail on the head there when he talks about uh, making that slogan of all of this together actually reality, because uh, I think that that's uh, the only way we'll really be able to uh, properly uh, defeat this virus if we are in it uh, all in this together. Um, so for our first question, uh, I'm going to go to something that we actually haven't uh, really discussed or touched on much yet, uh, but it's the new story today, I think. It's a, a, a potential vaccine from Pfizer. Um, and I want to put this one to you, Jerry, maybe first. Um, there's obviously quite a cause for optimism, I guess, uh, if the reports are to be believed. Now, again, it has to be said, I guess, that uh, the reports are just a press release at this stage. There is no actual published data that uh, scientists like yourself can scrutinise and uh, uh, and form an opinion on. But uh, where do you think uh, this leaves us now that there is potentially a vaccine on the horizon? What, what does it mean for uh, an elimination strategy or uh, the rest of the pandemic if there is uh, a vaccine on the horizon. What health warnings might you uh, might you offer, Jerry? I think we've uh, I think we've lost Jerry there for a second, unfortunately. So, oh, he's back. Did you get that, Jerry? Do you want me to repeat the question, or did you hear it? I didn't hear anything. Sorry. Apologies. Just, uh, I was introducing the news of uh, the potential vaccine we heard today at Pfizer's press release, and I was just wondering what your uh, thoughts are on this, what the major health warnings might be, what the implications are for how we deal with the pandemic going forward if there is uh, potentially an effective vaccine uh, on the horizon. Sure. Well, I think the level of efficacy is great news. I mean, 90% is as good as anybody could have asked for. So that's the first of the three big hurdles passed. Um, and it's the other other two that I think we've got to be mindful of. The first one is duration. You know, uh, it's one thing to have efficacy in the first uh, few weeks and months after an inoculate, you know, after being vaccinated. But, you know, the vaccines we usually rely on, they, 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 they produce protective effect for years. Otherwise, you have to re-vaccinate people, you know, uh, to, to top up that immunity. Um, so we got to be careful of that one. And then the other one is supply and the timelines required for that. So I did read through the full press release and I noticed um, they're forecasting, I think, uh, 150 million doses for next year or 50 million, I think, and 1.3 billion for 2022. Now, there's 8 billion people on the planet. So, you know, even if it's a perfect vaccine, we just need to be mindful of the realities of scaling up to a global population 
particularly if it's something you have to be re-vaccinated with on a regular basis. So for me, it's great news, but it doesn't change the rules of the game for the year ahead. Yeah, that's that, that, that's an important one. And I, I do wonder uh, a little bit about the effective news stories like today that they can maybe fuel uh, complacency. So I think it's important for people to understand that it's not a silver bullet or an immediate uh, solution to, to, to anything. It doesn't, as you say, change uh, the rules of the game. So I guess if we are still in a situation where the virus is with us, and we are uh, still a, a, a quite a susceptible population, susceptible to future waves, maybe uh, bears thinking about some of the other measures that we've uh, we've discussed uh, the document. So um, I'm just going to bring up a question here and I might put it to Richard first. Um, this one is, um, so they're asking about schools. Uh, should the HSA be doing random audits in schools? And I guess maybe open it up more generally, uh, Richard, to uh, what's been happening in the schools so far. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, the, I mean, first of all, I'm getting reports which are very worrying from schools, uh, from parents and teachers concerned about the uh, the close contact protocols that are being operated. So when positive cases are identified, uh, parents and teachers are mystified as to why people that would if the normal close contact protocols that that, uh, that come from the ECDC and the World Health Organization, why they're not being applied, uh, and uh, pe people that they would have thought should have been told to go home and quarantine and so on, uh, teachers who may have uh, been in contact <coughs> with uh, with cases. Uh, aren't being quarantined. So there's a lot of concern about that and it would seem that a different regime was operating or is operating in schools. Uh, so that's worrying people. I've also heard some very worrying stories about those who were sent home being told you're going contacted by the HSE within 24 hours for, and your child will be tested. Um, and then a week later, they still hadn't been contacted and had made successive attempts themselves to contact the HSE for tests. Now, I don't know how widespread that is, but it, it doesn't bode well. Or even, you know, horror stories of people going up and after a week of trying to get a test, arriving up at an appointment for a test center and discovering in one case, uh, three empty tents in an industrial estate in Sandyford with nobody in them, uh, and several cars circulating looking for the test center. Uh, uh, and, and and trying to access their tests, so that that all just a bit worrying uh, that that would be the case. Um, now, I mean, Jerry probably knows more about the sort of claims that uh, have been made by the government that the schools problematic from you know, transmitting the virus, but I certainly would be worried uh about about that and i'm worried that you know the resources are not in place about teachers 100 teachers who are identified as having uh underlying conditions but who are being told by essentially private a private company that they still have to go to work and uh, regardless of you know their possible vulnerability to a more severe doses of covid 19. so i find and then the overcrowded classrooms obviously we had most overcrowded classrooms in the whole of Europe, and we have terrible ventilation in a lot of uh, a lot of the schools um, because of just a failure to invest in school infrastructure over decades. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, you know worrying stuff in the schools. Uh, our view was they should have given it at least an extra week after the midterm to uh, try and address some of these problems. Um, but yeah, I, I find it quite worrying uh the the approach and it seems just keep the schools open because that sounds good rather than actually addressing uh the problems the lack of infrastructure and the other uh, support would be necessary to ensure health and safety in the schools 
Thanks for that, Richard. And um, I'll maybe come to you, Maeve, as well, because we've probably all heard the stories in the north. I know quite a few of the teaching unions in the north have uh, made similar kind of complaints about health and safety uh, in classrooms. And I know there's anecdotal reports of health uh, of, of teachers uh, getting quite sick and again, um, having no real recourse. So maybe if you could tell us a little bit about the situation and we maybe go to Jerry after that on uh, what kind of the international evidence says and what needs to happen. Um, I suppose I've only just heard from um, some friends who, who work in schools, but the, the hospital, to be fair, sounds like a safer place than the school is. Um, and, you know, I just think there was like little um, involvement with teachers and education workers in reopening schools. Like they had months of time to, to plan um, the reopening of schools safely. Um, and to get like extra education workers and support workers. Uh, but nothing happened. They just closed their eyes until uh, school was due to start and it was like business as usual. Um, and I think the only, the schools in the north closed there for two weeks over the Halloween break. Um, and I think the only additional uh, thing that they've put in place is making masks mandatory on, on uh, school buses. So I think it, it just points to a lack of consultation um, with those workers and students who are in education um, and decisions being made uh, without the, the knowledge of what's happening on the ground. Thanks for that, Maeve. Um, so we maybe go to Jerry on that one now. Um, I've heard quite worrying uh, reports there from Richard and from uh, Maeve about how uh, teachers and parents are uh, often left in the dark, unfortunately, about uh, the COVID risk inside schools. So let me put to you, what, what is the evidence telling us and uh, how well uh, are we actually uh, testing inside schools to get a picture of uh, the risk that they present? I think we've lost, I think we've unfortunately lost Jerry again there. Um, so I'll maybe go to a different question uh, until he can get back. Oh, here he is. Hi, Jerry. Can you hear us there? I, yeah, sorry. I got cut off. My apologies. No problem. Um, so we're just, uh, we heard reports there from Richard and from uh, Maeve about uh, kind of well, teachers and students and parents are kind of blind uh, to the actual risk that schools present. So I was wondering if you could maybe uh, clarify um, how risky is it that schools are up? What is the international evidence telling us? And also um, maybe a little bit about uh, how well the government and the state are testing inside schools to give us a picture uh, of the risk that they really pose. Um, well, I think... First thing is, one thing I'm, I'm very happy to have been wrong about is that I think the risks in schools are a lot lower than I would have imagined. Now, they are there, and it is an issue, but, you know, we are we are managing to get down on the downslope, even with the schools open. Now, it would be a bit faster without them, but, you know, schools are clearly not the primary driver. They do contribute, but they're not as big a part of the snowball as we would have imagined. Now, having said that, could we do things better? Yes. I mean, I think we've all heard these stories about slow testing, etc. Some of that is simply because teams are overwhelmed. You know, the, the bottom line is our public health teams are completely and totally submerged. Um, the one, the people I know are in similar positions to Maeve. You know, they're working to 11 o'clock at night, seven days a week. They, you know... They've no time with family. They barely sleep. They barely eat. And and then you just can't investigate at the level required. And you can't create public health doctors out of nowhere. You know, there's more to it than contact tracing. It needs investigation. It needs disease detectives. Now, simple things that we could do differently. The first thing that I would change is I would notify all casual contacts. This business that your child could be in school with somebody who's had COVID and nobody knows, nobody gets informed. That makes no sense to me. And a key part about this um, virus that should give people hope is that very few people are truly asymptomatic. Most people are what we call palsy symptomatic, meaning they do have a symptom, but it's very mild. And unless you're really tuned into that, it's very easy to brush it off. You know, it's the, the, the light tickly throat. 
it's the rash that maybe you don't see on the HSE guidelines. It can be diarrhea. Maybe you just don't feel right. But that should be a trigger to go get tested. Now, at present, you don't even know you've been in close contact. Whereas everybody, or as a casual contact, as soon as you know that, you're much more on alert. And that's part of the secret of the success in places like Australia. When there's an outbreak, there's zero secrecy. The whole town knows. And anybody who feels, you know, even somebody who's had a couple of beers too many isn't quite sure. They don't hesitate. They head down. They get tested. They don't have to go to their GP. They don't have to make an appointment. They don't have to queue. They just get tested. And, and that's the kind of comprehensive, inclusive, and relentless approach that we need to have, particularly if we're going to hold on to those gains. Otherwise, you know, every lockdown ultimately ends up being futile. Okay, thanks for that, Jerry. Uh, we have a couple of questions in here about uh, testing, and I guess since you brought it up, how, how our testing and our contact and case management system works, uh, maybe you could uh, also clarify just what a good uh, contact and case management system would look like. Um, I've heard from you before uh, on uh, the approach they've uh, rolled out in Australia, where you have uh, walk-in clinics, essentially, where you can get tested um, if you have any uh, symptoms whatsoever, to be sure. Um, what type of system uh, should we have in Ireland? Should it look like that? Uh, what, what needs to be better resourced? You also mentioned uh, public health doctors, and that's been one that uh, we're in touch with a group of public health doctors at the minute. I wasn't actually aware before the pandemic that we had no consultant public health doctors in Ireland, that they were uh, on an inferior status uh, compared to other uh, medical specialties. So I guess uh, in a very uh, brief way, what would a good contact and case management system look like, uh, Jerry? I think you're muted there. Uh, you're muted, Jerry. I think we're having some more technical problems, unfortunately, with uh, with Jerry's stream. So, I maybe move to uh, a different uh, a different question here. Um, re it's actually a comment. It's actually a comment, and I'll read it out here, and maybe uh, go to both. Uh, Richard and Mervla. She says, as a student nurse, I ask the same question. Would I be informed of a suspected or positive case before I arrive at non-paid placement? As supernumerary staff, the answer was no. Before Halloween break, two of three secondary schools in Carrick and Cross, County Monaghan, have had a high uh, number of positive cases and nothing reported about that. So maybe just uh, get uh, your feedback, Richard, or response, and you may have too. Uh, it's obviously shocking that a student nurse wouldn't be informed if they were in uh, contacted some of the four placements. Yeah, again, I, mean, I hate for... to say it, and I, I, I don't want to be sort of putting that back. Can you hear me, Connor? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I hate to be sort of purveyor of bad stories, but unfortunately, I've heard too many of those stories that nurses uh, is, uh, is, is presenting in that comment. I mean, uh, I've had a number of cases of people, con student nurses on placement contacting me saying that they actually want themselves because they're coming for whatever reason, they're coming from different counties or shared accommodation. And they were told, well, oh, you don't need to be tested. Um, in, in one case, discovering later that they actually, one of them was positive. Um, so yeah, that, I mean that is very very worrying, and kind of speaks to what Jerry was talking about earlier on about, you know, do we have a system that's reactive uh, to things, or do we have a proactive uh, system of really going after the virus with, uh, to use his word, relentless testing uh, and with a tracing regime and an investigative regime actually capable of really tracking down the virus and and you need resources uh, for that and the i mean just to say as well one of the very 
uh, I think telling things about just generally the resourcing of our health service is, I don't know if anybody mentioned this earlier, but certainly in the South, and I may can say about the North, we have one of the highest rates of infections among healthcare workers, and predominantly that's among nurses uh, and healthcare uh, of almost anywhere in the Western world. And that has to have something to do with the massive understaffing, the excessive hours that people are doing. And then, of course, it puts pressure on the health service not to have a robust testing regime or not to have good close contact protocols because they're desperately worried they don't have enough staff to keep that things together so they're, they're uh, and I, I mean i noticed looking at the um the minutes of the expert advisory group that that advises nefes that from a very early stage one of the big discussions they were having is about what the protocols should be for dealing with uh suspected cases or positive cases uh how long they should stay out of work when they could go work and all of that spoke to the fact that they were badly understaffed uh and therefore were trying to you know essentially they were taking risks that they wouldn't otherwise have been taking if they were properly staffed <laughs> Maybe we get uh, your uh, your input on that too, Maeve, because uh, you've probably seen and heard a lot of this stuff in the front lines in the north too. Is it a similar story? Yeah, I totally agree with Richard on that. Um, like in our trust, um, we do have a weekly testing for the oncology department. And I think it's either weekly or fortnightly for care homes, uh, both residents and staff. So I think that's really excellent. Um, but, at, you know, I think they, you know, that was the beginning and they haven't kind of progressed that to make sure that all like frontline health and social care workers are routinely tested. And I think, you know, the suspicions would be, as Richard has alluded to, that, you know, that would mean that we would lose so many staff who um, were, didn't have, were unsymptomatic, but positive. And uh, back to what Jerry was saying around uh, testing, um, like in the north anyway, there's very tight. Uh, requirements that you must meet in order to get a test, even for health and social care staff, um, whether it's you have a temperature, a cough, a new cough, um, and loss of taste or smell. So even if you like just don't feel right uh, and you are worried, but you know you would like to get a test just to just to make sure, like you don't meet the requirement and you're not allowed to get a test. And uh, you know I think that needs to change as well. Um, so that we can be proactive because we're not encouraged to be proactive at the moment. And then that, you know, does increase risk. Um, so, you know, definitely, I think more needs to be done for uh, routine staff testing. Um, it is good as well that every patient that's admitted to the hospital is, is uh, tested for COVID as well. So I think that's been a really good uh, progression that's happened since the beginning of this crisis. So there's some positives, but there needs to be a lot more uh, done with regards to, to routine testing. Thanks for that, Maeve. Um, so um, maybe go back to you, Jerry. now, just on um, what a good testing and tracing system would look like. Um, I've heard, we've got a couple of questions in here about testing. Uh, we'll go through a few of them. Um, first one is from Lola Hines. And Lola asks, what do you think of the mass testing trial in Liverpool? Should we be doing this? Another one, if I just find it, ask, there's another question asking about Slovakia, and Slovakia have just, uh, they're just about to complete um, a screening of their population. So I don't know if you could say something about that. Oh, we've lost Jerry again. Um, unfortunately, the technical questions were the ones that Jerry was going to take. <laughs> Not I'm back. Can you, can you hear us, Jerry? You hear us there, Jerry? Can you hear us there? Can you hear us? Okay. Um, I might go back uh, to a different question in that case. Um, Apologies for the technical difficulties here. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, we have a question here from uh, Rachel that I'll go to uh, Richard with first. And Rachel says, it's important to get uh, the strategy shared across sectors like hospitality, sport and entertainment. So they'll join the co call for the government to change its approach. Will it be long of representative sectors and unions uh, and the like? And I think we've all seen um, the specific problems that affect uh, taxi drivers, entertainment workers, and I guess people that work in sectors where uh, pandemic has made it basically impossible uh, for them to do their job. So um, I wonder what you think about uh, this, Richard. How would we, how do we win uh, those people to a zero COVID strategy? What do you think a zero COVID strategy has to offer uh, those people in those sectors? Yeah, well, I, I think the... It, it it has a lot to offer, and particularly when you talk about the arts and entertainment sector, because whereas the sort of up and down the levels of restrictions, living with COVID approach that the government are doing, might some respite from lockdown for some sectors, for certain sectors, it's very grim if that's all that's on offer. Uh, and the arts and music, live entertainment, taxi drivers, and some other sectors uh, uh, are going to be very badly hit by that because, you know, the, 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 they have effectively, there's been no respite from the impact of all of this for them for the entire time. While some got a bit of respite during the summer, for those sectors, they've been hammered from the beginning right up to now. So the only prospect of getting back to some sort of normality for those sectors is if we do eliminate uh, community transmission of the virus and get on top of it, get ahead of it, so that we can actually open up society properly. Um, so I think, yeah, there's a lot in it for them, but I think Rachel's point is well made that we need to go out and proactively make the case for it. Because I, I, I think one of the problems zero COVID has is that people imagine it's a permanent state of lockdown when in fact it's the opposite of that it's about trying to get beyond lockdowns uh by eliminating community transmission and then having the systems in place uh, to prevent further lockdowns um one other thing that i and i'd like jerry to maybe comment on this that uh, even though tony holohan has not uh, adopted a zero COVID strategy um he he was at the last briefing i went to he was making the uh the point when i argued zero covid that uh you know i said what kind of tr tr tracing and tracking regime do you need and he put a big emphasis which seemed to me correct on having really strongly locally resourced tracking and tracing uh and public health teams that you had to do this at a very local level not just at a sort of centralized hse level but you really had to have the resources, the teams, the staffs at a local level that could chase things down locally. Um, and I think that's that seems to me like uh, absolutely correct uh, 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 approach. And that's something that's desperately lacking uh, in our health services generally, but certainly in that area. Do you want to come in on that, Jerry? if your internet's back? Can you guys hear me? Yep. Huh. Sorry, I haven't heard much, but let me switch off the camera. Can you hear us there? No, I can hear you. Yep. Sorry. Sorry, I've missed so much. Really, my apologies to everybody. No worries. What was it they say? Don't work with children, animals, or technology. Uh <laughs> um so yeah that's it's it's fine um i guess the the, the question that we're, we're asking is that what would uh, an, an ideal uh, contact and case management system look like richard uh, mentioned that uh, tommy hulahan and the doll uh, emphasize the importance of locally led uh, testing and tracing i just wonder uh, what, what, what your opinion would be on that what would a good testing and tracing system look like in ireland um well, it would be led by a public health physician, as would our whole response. You know, we we have about 60 of them in the country. Most of them are. I 
think we might have lost Jerry there again, unfortunately. Um, okay. Um, on that one, uh, I think I'll go to uh, another question again, if we can find one that works. Um, it's a question here about the border. Um, so uh, I think uh, it's been real crutch. If we look at uh, the responses to any variables, we've been, I, I think, the only party that have formally supported an elimination strategy. And whenever uh, it comes up, the border is waived as a... Uh, the reason you can't uh, do a zero COVID uh, 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 strategy, the reason you can't pursue one. So I don't know, um, maybe Richard and then Maeve, uh, your comments on that and how we can maybe transcend that uh, and set uh, an agenda for an All-Ireland uh, COVID response, because it makes no sense that on such a small island, uh, we have two completely different systems in operation, two systems that often contradict uh, one another um, and make the, the, the situation worse. Yeah, well, I I, I think the, uh, the the Australia example is uh, a good one to kind of refute that. Uh, in that uh, they uh, you know they have lots of different states, uh, but that hasn't prevented them, and it's a huge territory, but it hasn't prevented them from uh, pursuing an elimination uh, an elimination strategy. Uh, I mean, obviously, there is difficulties here in Ireland in the sense of two jurisdictions and particularly the attitude of the DUP uh, and so on. But I think uh, it's obvious to everybody, North and South, particularly when, the, when the, the situation in terms of the figures in the North are, you know, going in the wrong direction, have been going in the wrong direction, that I think there's a very strong case to be made for uh, having a coordinated strategy and you know it's just such so obviously the fact that we're a single epidemic epidemiological uh, unit if you like uh, that it, that coordination makes sense for everybody so um, yeah I, I don't buy that I think if you proactively go out and make an argument makes sense to people and that has been part of the problem uh, in much of the dealing with COVID, that at times, you know, at times the message was clear and the people reacted well. At other times, the message was confused, incoherent and unclear. And then the population got confused and unclear. Uh, so if you make a clear argument, if you've got a clear strategy that makes sense to people, then I think north and south of the border, people will see the sense of that strategy but you need you need leadership at uh, that argument do you want to come in on that one as well Maeve? yeah i suppose living uh in a border region um like the border doesn't exist in so many ways for so many people like people live on one side and work on the other they're you know, families uh, live on one side and they live on another. Their childcare lives on another, you know. So it's so integrated. So to to have different strategies makes it even more confusing. Um, and uh, because we do feel like the one, the one region. Um, and there's already so many healthcare services which operate cross borders, such as our Northwest Cancer Centre, um, the kind of Northwest cardiac services and like there's an all Ireland children's cardiac service available as well. So there's already really good uh, kind of north south cooperation when it comes to healthcare. So I, I don't know why they can't get it together when it comes to uh, addressing COVID and having an all Ireland COVID strategy. Because if we're supposed to come out of our circuit breaker lockdown um, at the end of this week, uh, but Donegal still um, in in like level five lockdown until the start of December. Like you know, are we you know do we cross the border or you know what like do we play by our rules in the south or you know it it just gets a lot more confusing. Um, and I think it really uh, whenever the lockdown first began and the south you know took the decision to go into lockdown um, back in March uh, before um, Boris Johnson. Um, instructed us to. I think that really saved the Northwest when it came to the COVID cases and the first surge. We followed Donegal's lead, we followed the South's lead, and that, that was to our advantage. But I think it can work to a disadvantage now as well because we 
have have had such a bad second surge uh, as has Donegal, and you know, so the the patterns are are cross border as well. So we definitely need, I feel like a an all Ireland strategy, but uh, you know, one that sees regions rather than than borders. Yeah, thanks for that, Maeve. Um, I'm going to try uh, go to Jerry uh, once more here, uh, and hopefully the internet doesn't cut out. Uh, this time, but maybe just ask Jerry. Uh, you've uh, spoken before about uh, how this kind of uh, border region concept or border bubble um, in in Australia worked between states. And um, so, could you maybe uh, give us a bit of detail on uh, how a similar type of solution could work in Ireland, uh, and how we could, uh, I guess, work over those areas where there are. Uh, um, I guess uh, where the border doesn't exist for most people uh, living in the regions. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Hello? Can anybody yeah, can hear you? Hear you. No. Connor, yeah, okay, you guys have got me. Ahoy! Okay, so just quickly, while the internet lasts, um, in Australia, they had border communities with border bubbles, so that everybody who lived on a border and had an office on the other side of it, or family on the other side of it, got a smart card with their photograph on it. They could cross the border. They couldn't go more than 30 kilometers further. They'd be stopped at the next checkpoint. Life on the borders went on. All those people were carefully monitored, and there are solutions. And it, like Donegal and Derry is one big system. It should be integrated. It could span the border. So there's solutions. I think our biggest problem in this country is can't do attitude, and we need to get past that. Okay, well, we uh, have you there, Derry. I might go back to a question that we had uh, a little bit earlier. Just on what a, a good contact and case management system would look like. Um, there have been some specific questions in about testing, uh, particularly about uh, screening of populations. Uh, looking at uh, Liverpool as a recent example, where uh, in Britain they're trialling mass testing. Um, and also Slovakia, where uh, they've screened uh, their population in a very uh, short period of time. I think they just finished yesterday, actually, in their uh, screening efforts. So maybe you could come in on what a good uh, contact and case manager or test trace and isolate system would look like in Ireland. Okay, <laughs> it wasn't to be, unfortunately. Um, I think we've kind of gotten to, uh, unfortunately, the end of the, the, the questions that the rest of us can uh, confidently address here. So uh, on that one, I think, actually, we are at nine o'clock now. We've been on for uh, an hour and a half. So uh, I'll maybe uh, just invite Maeve and Richard to give any closing remarks uh, that they want. And unfortunately, because of the internet, we can't hear uh, uh, Jerry's answer, down, but I'm sure he will uh, give it to us. And there are uh, answers in the document if people want to read that too. Just before I hand back to uh, Richard and Maeve, uh, I'd like to encourage everyone who's still watching uh, to uh, tune in on Wednesday for our next uh, Healthcare Week meeting. So that will be uh, on healthcare workers' pay and conditions. Uh, we'll have some healthcare workers from the north who are uh, currently uh, uh, in a pay uh, in a situation, pay demand, where they're looking for uh, respect for the work that they put in. And uh, we have some uh, healthcare workers workers from the South too, in particular a student nurse is going to tell us about uh, the situation they've experienced where they're not being paid for placement and still not allowed uh, work uh, in, in, set, in settings outside. So maybe go to you Richard first uh, for your closing remarks, but I would encourage people to tune in on Wednesday. You're muted Richard. You're muted. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would have thought as COVID, we should have learned some very important and must learn some very important lessons with 19. Um, uh, 
that you need to put the, the you know, society, the needs of society and the people who live in it first. Uh, and we have learned to our cost uh, with COVID that if you, if you face a sort of an external crisis like COVID-19, with a massively under-resourced health service, with a fragmented, half privatized service, understaffed, with overcrowded schools, uh, and with uh, a sort of political philosophy that doesn't say that the needs of society, its health and welfare, should t take preeminence over other considerations, particularly the considerations of money and profit, eventually you're going to find yourself in a very difficult situation. And we're in that situation now. Um, and I hope it will prompt us uh, to make radical changes in the priorities in our way, not just to deal with COVID in the immediacy and to pursue a COVID strategy and to have the resources uh, and investment necessary, but also to make sure that our society is actually up to prevent crises like this and to be able to deal with exceptional uh, and emergency situations uh, far better than we currently have been able to. Um, and I think that's the big lesson. Uh, so it's not just a lesson for the here and now and uh, the best strategy for the coming months, but I also think it's about pointing in the direction of, of a society which has different priorities uh, and where the health and education and general well-being of the majority takes precedence over you know, or other uh, considerations, um, you know, that aren't about the best interests of society as a whole. That, to me, is the big lesson of this crisis, and I hope we learn it fast. Thanks, Richard. Um, we'll go to you, Maeve, maybe, before, and we'll try Jerry one last time, uh, if you want to give closing remarks, but you first. Thanks, and thanks to um, Richard and Jerry um, for your your great talks, and and for Connor for doing an excellent job at sharing as well with all the technical stuff about this. Um, I suppose I just want to kind of like say that like for years, like our health service has just been under attack with like savage like cuts from the Tories and uh over the last 10 years in the north um and i know that the health healthcare service in the south has fared no better in terms of cuts and with privatization um and you know so we're, we've we've been at a really poor starting point as well as like our society is unhealthy you know we have a, a real mental health crisis that was in existence before the covid crisis came near us um and we there's like there's so many problems in our society and often whenever we are working with people in the hospital in order for us to actually support them and their health and well-being we actually need to change the world around them um so i think you know the covid what you know once we get beyond this covid crisis and it's so important that uh, workers' demands are heard and workers feel safe in their workplaces. Um, but we also need to make sure that we <clears throat> begin to uh, make the demands for the type of world that uh, we need to see after COVID. Like, we've, we've suffered so much great loss with this crisis, but with um, great loss, um, it, gives us, it gives us a focus for what's important, kind of what sustains us. Um, and like what our what our bread and what our roses are that we're that we're fighting for, and um, our healthcare service, the work that we do is founded in care, and that's the type of world that we need to 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 fashion after this crisis and during this crisis is uh, is one that's founded on care, and uh, it's so important during this crisis that we care for each other and we like bring that uh, to the community as well, um, because I think. Uh, the needs of profit and the needs of business seems to be uh, the priority at the moment, and and it just goes to show us where our politicians' priorities are with the with the those in government, where their priorities lie is uh, to save profit and to save business rather than to save lives. Um, and it's always the healthcare service that gets get, that gets landed with their incompetence. So let's fight this on now. The the work continues now, but uh, we need to work on a vision that's that's going to be healthier and and better um, for beyond the crisis. 
Thanks, Maeve. Um, Jerry, any closing words? I'll give it a go. Can you hear me? Yep. Fantastic. I'll make it quick then. Uh, just, you know, COVID loves vulnerability. It loves inequity. It loves, um, it loves division. It loves fragmentation. It loves um, societies at each other's throats. And it really loves protracted, extended debate and indecision. And our generation will be judged by whether we can look the devil in the eye and make the clear, stark choices that it presents us with. And history will judge us. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, with those words, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in uh, i'd encourage you all again to take a look at our uh, at our document and our proposals um, and to uh, tune back in later on the week for the rest of our uh, healthcare week meetings we'll also have uh, some socially distanced um, demonstrations take place in different places in the country you'll see that on our social media so check in there if there's something nearby uh, try to support it and uh, give it a share on social media thanks everyone for watching see you good night Thanks, everybody. Take care, everybody.